a performer considers the concert hall as a musical instrument, um, the musical instrument is, I mean, that is the ultimate musical instrument. Yeah, musicians are great. They're adaptable. They'll play in any condition with any instrument. You can pound two rocks together and make music, and a good musician can anyway. And the, uh, the, the notion of taking it to the highest possible quality, where every nuance and level of expression is, is uh, maximized, you know, that's what we're talking about in a hall like this. You know, for many years we've had a, uh, a wonderful performance program in Stanford Lively Arts, but it hasn't had a good venue. Dinkelspiel was advertised in the 1950s when it was opened in 1957 as the concert hall of tomorrow. But we soon, of course, not, well not so soon, but in, in the last decade or so, we've been aware of the fact that tomorrow is very much yesterday. When I think back on Stanford's history, it seems at certain important moments, there almost seemed to be divine guidance coming down to help us. And those of you that go over and look at the site will see the remnants of a foundation that was once supposed to be a gymnasium. But the Lord said, no, the Bings will want their concert hall right there on the axis and took care of that gymnasium in the 1906 earthquake. So we are indeed fortunate to have this great site available and to build this wonderful arts district. Peter and Helen Bing wanted to provide the students with an environment where they could realize their abilities as performers. Um, Helen Bing has traveled extensively with ensembles within the music department and she's come to so many performances over the years. She's fully aware of what a wonderful space can facilitate for students. I've never seen a level of hands-on caring like that with any of our other clients. Peter wants to pick every switchblade, every color. He wants to know, he wants to think about that whole process. He cares deeply about it and he makes sure that it's gonna happen right. Number one, we wanted a venue with world-class acoustics. We were not going to compromise on that. And number two, we wanted a venue that had a, an exceptional patron experience. Uh, we weren't going to compromise on that. It's especially for a university where so many students have rarely experienced live performance in the sort of environment that we were talking about. So the audience experience was the first consideration. The second consideration was what sort of environment was really, would really be important for artists to do their best work. Performance is all about connection. It's about connecting to your audience, connecting to the people on stage with you, connecting to the music in a very deep, personal way. And in a space like Bing, the hall is part of that. Thank you. Very beautiful. Sure. thing we did was travel the country and look at halls and interview about two dozen people to see what's involved in building a hall. Because when we started the process, um, you know, this idea of a, of a concert hall in the round is somewhat controversial. It's not, um, it's not de rigueur these days, although there are increasing numbers of them. Yasu Toyota is one of the best, if not the best, acquisition in the world. Yasu designed the Disney Concert Hall, and he talked to us about psychoacoustics. He said, this is a small hall, it's less than 900 seats, anybody can make the hall sound good. But what's important is not only that the hall sounds good, but performers feel wonderful as they play, and patrons feel great in the space. The only thing he ever said was, there were a few dimensions, he said, I want it to be 45 feet from the stage to the ceiling above the conductor. Not 48, not 40, I want 45 feet. And we said, okay, you know, well, we can do that. Beyond that, I think anything goes. He's, he was willing to entertain any kind of shape that we could imagine. We might use physical models and drawings to actually make a shape that we imagine. Then we make a computer model of that. We send it to Yasu's people. They run a test on it. It comes back a few days later. It looks like a CAT scan. It looks like, you know, like something your doctor's gonna give you. And we did it 
19 times. And each time he would say, it was a little better before. It was a little better before. So after number 19, we dumped it. And we said, okay, let's, let's try a different idea, just something totally different. And that is the design we have now, where we made a room that was shaped of what we call sails, and they are all convex, and they're arranged in a kind of elliptical fashion, uh, very much around an oval room. In every surface, there's actually not one straight line inside of this room anywhere. We sent that away, and he came back, and Yasu said, this is beautiful. He said, this is the most beautiful one we have had yet. I think it's going to be fantastic. And then he said, that's it. We're not changing anything else. It has to stay this way. That's it. couple of big ideas about the building. One is that it's a concert hall in the woods. So it's in the Arboretum, it's surrounded by trees, and it has an indoor-outdoor design. So the trees come inside in the atria, there are four atria inside the building. The whole south side of the lobby is an arcade. Um, it's used just like the main quad to help filter sun, but also as a place where people can gather. Stanford's about bringing people together, and then the lobby's been designed to be able to accommodate that. We focused a lot on the patron experience, but we also focused on the performer's experience. We visited a lot of halls and they told us, make the performer's spaces comfortable for them so they want to come back. And then there's the rehearsal hall, which gives them an opportunity to warm up in a room, which is you know very similar to the stage they're gonna go out on. The hall is unique in higher ed to my experience because it was designed to be both a facility to showcase the greatest artists in the world and also as a teaching facility. So they'll be performing over here and rehearsing over there and teaching in another room and in a social space that enables people to really get to know each other. It's, it's pretty perfect, to be honest with you. It's, it's better than Juilliard. <laughs> In, in a concert hall, you know, we cannot control those, uh, for instance, the volume of the violin, okay? The volume of the orchestra, we, we, we don't control. So this is why the natural acoustics is so important. You want to have a room where you're not, where sound is bouncing in a uh, rich way around the room and you're getting reflections of different wavelengths for everybody. And we don't use the microphone. We don't use the loudspeaker. And so the architectural things, like uh, dimensions or the shape of room, uh, as well as uh, the materials, those are very, very important for our room acoustics. The wood walls are made of seven different sine curve radii, and then the scripting program puts them together randomly so that you don't ever get any patches where there would be regularity in the pattern that would cause reflections to happen in an adverse way. The wall type under the sails and this is, what is a pattern, and the same pattern is actually on the ceiling, but at twice the scale, three times the scale. Um, and that was derived from another series of sine curves that are then spun in three dimensions. The sails themselves have uh, a material on it that's actually kind of bumpy in a more micro way, less of a macro way, because Yasu wants every surface to uh, reflect and disseminate sound in all directions, not, not just straight back at its source. The function of those uh, texture uh, in the surface is giving us uh, the uh, diffusion or scattering, then uh, we can have the sound or reflections more even way, or the sound impression is more soft. If you think about musical instruments, um, there's an excitation and a resonator. Um, those are the two principal components of, of any musical instrument. And so the excitation is the initial signal that's being sent out by the performer. 
And the resonator and the reverberator and the, the, um, the, the acoustic attributes of what happens to that signal, how it's filtered and how it's processed, those are the, those are the tasks of the hall. There's a story that they've told me about, um, about uh, Yasu Toyota that when, he, uh, when they opened Disney Hall, which he designed, um, they had the first rehearsal and the first break. The one uh, principal clarinet, clarinet uh, musician, and then she came to me saying that we don't hear. We don't hear so well on the stage. So it, it was not a big surprise to me, okay? At the next session, they said, what did you do? It's fantastic. He said, I didn't do anything. You just heard it differently. This is the process and for musician to learn the new, new stage, the new acoustics, how to hear. So it is taking time. I'm not worrying about the opening day, but I have to be nervous the first moment of the first note. Today is October 10th, and we have invited the St. Lawrence String Quartet to come to Bing Concert Hall and to play in it for the first time. And even though it's very much part of the process of completing the hall, it's a very poignant moment, I think, for, um, for all of us. amalgam of this warmth and natural bloom to the sound, but a clarity, oh, it's, it's just incredible. It's going to be amazing. I think people may be familiar with the idea of theatre in the round, but less with the conception of a concert hall designed as music performance in the round. Lately, there has been much more of a movement towards uh, in the round kinds of, kinds of halls and, and in a notion of what is known as vineyard style seating in which you put groups of people uh, in small boxes. There are seats all the way around and people sit all the way around so they can experience the performance any way they choose. They can look at the conductor, they can look at the first violinist, they can sit up in the chorus. I learned that uh, the impression, including the acoustical impression and the visual impression in those uh, the vineyard style concert halls. The intimacy is super.
So one of the things that I think is very exciting about theater as it might be performed at the Bing is that it is a much more participatory kind of event where you're very much aware of a performance happening and taking place and that you as an audience are literally conscripted into the space as a witness and a participant much more than just a passive viewer. When a performance is great, the audience becomes one. They start kind of breathing together and you know and the exhalation is almost together and the, and if it's a play then the laughter it creates a a deeper, bigger sense of community. This is a really important building for the university community and as well as the community at large. Um, and I think a lot of people just look at it as a building that might be about putting on great concerts or, or, or unique musical venues that we can't right now um, host on our campus. But I think the building's more than that. I think it's really a catalyst. If you can imagine this being at the center of the arts district, it really to me becomes just a really a strong anchor for a lot of other things to happen. The arts district was a, uh, a vision that grew organically as we get, began to put together the various pieces the Bing Concert Hall, obviously the Cantor Center, but then thinking about the McMurtry Building and, and the Anderson Collection downstream. And it grew organically out of a vision that the arts represent an ideal front door to our campus, and also a gathering spot for people on campus interested in performance and creativity. One, two, three, go. The thing that we want to do almost more than anything is to help students feel that this is their hall. The empowering aspect of, of a facility like Bing Hall is, is going to be felt when very informal but very important things happen with students who can have access to it. It's going to be memorable, it's going to reinforce and enforce all the things they've studied and they're going to do new things that they haven't done because of this. One of the unique things and one of the things that as a faculty member I find really exciting about the arts community at Stanford is that it involves students from such an incredibly wide breadth of academic discipline. We've got students who are amazing facility and musicianship and experience, but they're going to be an engineer or a historian or whatever they're going to be, but it probably won't be um, a professional musician. That kind of intellectual acuity and diversity I find really thrilling here. And it also means that when they're engaged in music performance, they're doing it because they love it. Stanford has a rich uh, history of performance and it's a very diverse one. Many years ago, the musicology department was best known for its early music performance practice uh, and being a department that really favored practice over theory. But at the same time, the same university has evolved. We are the home of the Pan-Asian Music Festival. We are the home of Karma, one of the leading uh, music research centers in the world for music and technology and the FM synthesizer was born here. So that interface between music and technology and um, a global perspective are all embodied by Stanford's music department. We're at a point now in, in, uh, in society, in Western society, where the vast majority of music listening is done with earbuds or, or headphones or in a, in a small private space. It's often done while we're on the run or while we're doing something else. All of that private listening, you shut yourself off from communal listening. You go to a live concert and all of a sudden, it's not just you and the music, it's you and those 105 people in the orchestra who are performing the music. There is simply no sound that can be matched by an acoustic instrument in a live environment in a beautiful space.
the sound quality is one factor, but the, but the collective communal experience, the sense of, of entrainment, how, how audiences come to hear something together, to respond to it together as a group. This is what we cannot get in the from iPod. In the sunshine of this lovely moment, let's bid welcome to this nascent addition to the Stanford family and note that this is the first of your springs. Your birthday will always come in this season of renewal. Renewal of the natural world around you and the renewal that the arts will always provide for those who gather in concert with you. So happy birthday. Together, we all hope that like a great instrument, Time will forever increase your beauty and the glory of your voice. <laughs>